Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and today I don't know whether we're going to Georgia, or which is a country, or, or to um, near, uh, Boston. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk to my guest, uh, who is uh, Zviad Adenbaya, who's a Georgian, and uh, he is also. Um, Work, somebody who works at Tufts University at the Fletcher School of Diplomacy or whatever it's called these days. So hello, Zviad. Thank you for having me. Hello to you and hello to anyone watching. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to, to get acquainted. I know lots of Georgians, uh, but um, I have met you until about 30 seconds ago. So uh, I, I, as I understand it, uh, you are, um, well, almost a refugee. <laughs> that is, I believe, I read something about your early life that you were in Georgia and you had to, your family had to flee because the war came with the Russians. And you are uh, very engaged with the, the internet and the misuses of the internet by nefarious people and for nefarious purposes. And that's mostly Russians, as I understand it. Right? Have I got it so far? Exactly. Okay. I don't know where to start with this, but let's do a little recap of your life. So you were born in Georgia. Uh, and uh, by the way, on Google, it says you speak this very interesting language. What's it called? It starts with an M. Megrelian. Megrelian. Thank and you so I much for noting that. Well, and, that, and you got me started wondering who these people are, these Migrellians. So I started looking it up and, and then I got interested in the kind of cheese bread that you guys make. So now I want to try making some Migrellian cheese bread. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your early life and how you came to be the guy you are. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer. There are some nuances that you mentioned about my life, about the places I come, uh, place I come from, and I really appreciate uh, those nuances. I come from uh, Georgia's uh, western uh, part, that's called Abkhazia. I was born there. Abkhazia, as you know, and uh, many in the international audience do know, is under current Russian occupation. So it was um, 1993. Uh, when myself um, as a kid and then my family and 200,000 other ethnic Georgians were displaced uh, using force. Um, and that's make, that makes me a documented uh, internally displaced person. In fact, that's where I start, um, that's where um, uh, my inspiration and the life story comes from. So when I look at um, uh, things happening in Ukraine, things happening elsewhere, but you know, immediately uh, in Ukraine, uh, that is resonates with me because that's um, how my childhood was, uh, and that's where I feel personally uh, committed before being professionally uh, uh, committed. So I grew up in Western, uh, in an adjacent uh, town to Abkhazia, Gali region, to Abkhazia called Zugdidi. There, there, there is. That's the town where. I grew up uh, and I started developing uh, my conscious uh, and you know went to school. Uh, but uh, what happened uh, was uh, why I came to be where I am uh, is that uh, when I was in high school, Russians invaded um, uh, Georgia again in uh, 2008. At the time, I was uh, choosing my profession, uh, and uh, there was one quite important thing to me and to my family, and that could be um, hopefully perhaps uh, uh, relevant to many other uh, 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 families here in Georgia, is that uh, we built house after we were kicked out of our houses and we rebuilt um, our selves mentally, physically, intellectually, because we were hit and we were kicked out of our homes where we grew up and where we were born. Um, and at the time, it was uh, it was not negotiable to leave another house, another home that we built for many, many years. And at the time I was choosing, hey, um, I am choosing a profession. Is there anything that 
I could choose that would also contribute to uh, my hopes and dreams, which is uh, living in a Georgia, which is unified and which is secure, which is NATO member, hopefully, which is peaceful and so on and so forth with that. Uh, it took me to political science, that took me to international affairs as a student. Uh, uh, previously, and I'll close here, I and my family, we sold fish um, uh, in uh, fish, vegetables, and fruits in an open bazaar. I would not imagine I would ever go into security or uh, uh, international affairs world. I did that for many years. Uh, then, then gradually I came to the capital uh, of Georgia, Tbilisi, as a political science uh, uh, a freshman uh, years after, and then um, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, NATO, Defense College, European Parliament, and other exciting uh, projects uh, in my life, which for which I'm grateful. So currently, and I'll close here. I am at where information is as a tool and as a weapon, as a tool where people can really change things for better and hearts and minds where when it comes to improving someone's daily affairs, improving someone's businesses, but as a weapon when it comes to exploiting uh, free speech or exploiting unaware society. And uh, my colleagues feel passionate and committed to the idea of, on the one hand, countering and trying to uh, tackle malign information operations and try to uh, promote a uh, information integrity uh, mm -hmm. as much as possible. Okay. You say you're from Akhazia, and I remember uh, the time when the Russians were invading that area. And, and there's, as I understand it, there's Abkhazia or Abkhazia, <laughs> the way the Russians say it, uh, and, um, and South Ossetia, is that right? And both of those are now are they occupied by Russia or is there a puppet regime or what? But I have the impression that it's not under, under Georgia's control. It is not, you, uh, you noted uh, correctly. It is occupied because uh, there are Russian troops without invitation, um, without Georgia's invitation. Uh, in the 90s, when Georgia declared independence Russia as a nation state um, did recognize Georgia uh, as a sovereign uh, nation, as a sovereign country, as did, as was the case with the rest of the world of the United Nations member states. Um, and after that, things happened and there were no reasons uh, for Georgians to secede as Georgia uh, is quite colorful a multi-ethnic uh, country which uh, hosts a number of ethnicities and several languages and subcultures uh, and so on for, for many centuries now. Um, and uh, in 2008, before Russians had troops called uh, from the 90s on Georgia proper and on those two regions, uh, um, especially called peace, uh, 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 peace builders or uh, 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 peacemakers, uh, peace forces. Uh, unfortunately, those forces, we are not there for peace. Uh, those forces, we are there to not let Georgia reunify in any fashion. And uh, those forces, we are then uh, partially uh, used to invade uh, the rest of Georgia beyond those regions. Uh, and uh, according to okay, the United what was, what was the occasion? What made them decide why, let's see, who would have been in charge? Was that in Yeltsin's time or? Uh, in, the, in, the 90s, in the 90s, it was Yeltsin who started uh -huh. um, a so-called uh, rebellion, as is the case now, as is the case now in the Ukrainian regions, in the Donbass I region. see. So they instigated a re rebellion on the part of people were these Russian speakers in in Abkhazia or did they have any, not. any rationale for why they were trying to stir them up as as wanting independence from Georgia the um these were um two autonomous regions within the Republic of Georgia even under uh the Soviet Union uh, and these regions are culturally historically been have been Georgia 
uh, for uh, many, many years and decades. Um, but um, under Stalin, as was the case with the rest of the region, in, with the, um, here in, the, in, in some other parts of the South Caucasus, then in Moldova, uh, here and there, uh, Stalin created those autonomous regions for one purpose. And that one purpose would be if any of the republics would try to secede for uh, any reason uh, from the uh, Soviet Union, which was a constitutional uh, of right, mm -hmm. uh, even officially in the Soviet Union, to secede. Mm -hmm. um, if that would happen, uh, then those republics would be punished. Uh, and that's where punishment came in the 90s. But in 2008, uh, uh, Russia, now as a separate state, not the Soviet Union, um, invaded uh, Georgia from the Tskinvali region, then from the Abkhazia region, and the rest of Georgia, that was under uh, Dmitry Medvedev uh, when Putin was uh, a prime minister at the time. Okay, so the, the, the logic or, of what they were trying to do differed in the two periods. The first time it was, uh, I'm not sure I understand what their rationale was on these two occasions, because the second time Russia was an independent country, but the first, no, it would have been both. Both times, Russia would have already been, the Soviet Union would have been gone by then. So uh, what was, you know, what was going on in their minds? Why, the, why did they try to do this? Sure. Uh, yes, Russia was a separate country at the time. Soviet Union was recent, had recently gone now one and a half years or so at the time in the 90, uh, 1993. Um, the rationale for them was that they tried to convince the rest of the, the world. Now imagine 90s, um, the West is distracted. There is some things going in the Western Balkans, so on and so forth. Um, and Georgia, uh, which was considered to be a troublemaker uh, in the Soviet Union because Georgia's would demand um, extra rights. Georgia's would demand the protection of the Georgian language as, a, um, as an ancient language, as a legitimate language. Um, uh, and parts of the Georgian statehood, so on and so forth. And so if they Georgian were already independent. Why weren't they in control of that anyway? Right. Why would they have to be demanding it from Russia? That's right. Um, so Georgians were known for being so-called troublemakers within the Soviet Union. Now the Soviet Union gone, uh -huh. Georgians were one of the first to declare uh, independence. And for that reason, the uh, earlier seeds to punish anyone who would seek independence came to fruition and they said, you know, there are now two separatist regions that are going to declare secession from you because you guys are suppressing them. Um, and then they repeated the narrative in 2008 that Georgians were trying to cause, uh, instigate a genocide um, against small uh, parts of the nation. Therefore, that would justify uh, separatism and the Russians would come uh, to aid them. As that was the scenario at the time. There was they, no but the goal was not to reabsorb them into Russia, but just to make them separate from, from Georgia. Yes. And, uh, and that's why yes. they attacked Georgia. Did they, did they attack Georgia directly or they just send troops into these two provinces or regions? Uh, troops and weapons and uh, uh, Chechen and other South uh, uh, North uh, Caucasian mercenaries. Uh, 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 you know, before the little green man went to the parts of Ukraine in 2014, they were here uh, to fight the just war, uh, so-called just war for the oppressed. Now, what happened uh, was that usually whoever is oppressed is you know trying to secede now what happened was the opposite the minority uh, uh, with the russian help say 20 percent of the entire population in abkhazia with the russian help expelled from the entire region the majority of ethnic georgians which was 200,000 uh, people, including me and my family. Um, and uh, that's what happened. The Russians wanted to accomplish at least uh, two key objectives. First, uh, to have grip on Georgia, 
and any future decision that Georgians would make, uh, uh, whether Russians would like it or not, because Georgia uh, is, is uh, uh, one of the key players in the region because of its uh, uh, location, uh, its access to the Black Sea, um, uh, one of the regions, Abkhazia, is um, located on the Black Sea uh, and adjacent to the rest of Russia. It was quite strategic for Russians to uh, have control, effective control. Uh, they could not initially say that we want to absorb uh, those territories, but now they're saying that uh, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're signaling that they're willing to absorb those uh, two regions as they did. Uh, I'm sorry, with... absorb, did you say? Absorb. Um, or they fact, really want to incorporate them into Russia now. Exactly, annex them officially. And they basically are occupying those two regions now, right? They are. Uh, they're occupying and uh, they're, uh, they're even uh, funding the majority of the budgets for those two regions, uh, puppet regimes. And uh, in fact, they're the, the, the regimes that call themselves um, uh, uh, legitimate regimes of those so-called states, uh, they have effectively no control on their own key home affairs. Well, okay. So this sounds like the first, I don't know whether it was the first, but it sounds like it may have been the first kind of move in what is becoming apparent now as, as um, Putin's strategy to reassemble the Soviet Union and collect all these pieces back into his uh, folds. Um, Putin made a speech about a month ago that kind of, uh, I think it really told the truth for once, he, he wants to be Peter the Great, <laughs> and he wants to put everything back together that, you know, used to belong to him. Should have, he, it should have been what he inherited, but he didn't get it. And so, but apparently that was the game plan even before it was um, declared as such, but it's clearly the game plan now, right? Exactly. Um, in, in, in our daily operations, we uh, use this phrase, uh, truth is power, uh, but what Putin does is the opposite. He says, and who wants the rest of the world believe that power is the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and he believes in Peter the Great, believes in Ivan the Terrible and others. Uh, he takes a lot of pride. He wants to be a 21st century version uh, of them. Uh, and that, that's where we clash, uh, Georgians, are the ancient, uh, one of the ancient uh, uh, nation. Uh, Georgians have their own alphabet. Georgians have their own um, language. Even couple languages on the ground uh, take pride for many things. Um, and naturally there is a clash. Georgians want, for that reason, belong where they feel and they believe to belong. To be belonging is the European Union and NATO. Um, and Putin wants to divide and rule, divide because Putin wants to make NATO believe that countries with so-called internal conflicts cannot join NATO or any other alliance. Um, and that's where the, the conflict stands now. But uh, well, was uh, he that frank all along? I have the feeling that it's sort of like he blurted it out, the real truth the other day for the first time. That, uh, you know, because it's completely inconsistent with his other rationale. His real, uh, you know, his expressed reason for attacking uh, Ukraine was to protect the people in uh, the, the, the Donbass, the Russian speakers in the Donbass, and, uh, and, and, and to, uh, uh, to make sure that NATO didn't get too close. And, um, I, I guess there, I didn't think they should, NATO should go there either. You and I would probably disagree about that, but I, I thought it was a mistake at the time, but it certainly was not the kind of mistake that would justify in any, anywhere near justify what he did. And, and in fact, I think it was a fairly small um, issue. It shouldn't have been considered a, a big threat because it wasn't really a threat, but anyway, but he, he, he pretended that his rationale for attacking Ukraine was to keep NATO away 
and to protect these poor Russians in the Donbass who were being um, subject to genocide. <laughs> um, but I don't think he's even pretending that anymore, is he? He's not. Um, he's um, the rest of the world knows where he wants to go, where he could not go, fortunately, so far. Um, where Ukraine and Georgia are deeply interconnected there when it comes to Putin's anti-NATO NATO strategies uh, that in 2008, the world knows this, the NATO's Bucharest summit promised Ukraine and Georgia a, a membership, ultimate membership into the alliance. Now, there is, as a Georgian and as a professional who has also spent some time uh, researching and uh, researching NATO and at the NATO Defense College in Rome, I would say that sometimes it's uh, mis misperceived what happened in terms of NATO enlargement uh, when we talk about Putin. Sometimes or oftentimes we talk that NATO wanted to expand towards the east, um, and that's a major uh, uh, mistake that we make in discussing because. It's not NATO trying to expand, it's those nations yes. trying to fulfill so many requirements to get there uh, because they do not feel safe. Otherwise, that was the case with Central and Eastern Europe, first in the 98 uh, enlargement, uh, and then in, in the beginning of 2000s, and then it was Ukraine and Georgia. NATO was skeptical, actually, to incorporate Ukraine and Georgia into the alliance because they say, you know, uh, Ukraine and Georgia would need to meet those uh, 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 many uh, uh, criteria and Georgia and Ukraine would strive to get there and carry out those reforms to be qualify. And then Russians would, uh, Russians would qualify as an expansion, uh, use that term specifically in their um, everyday statements, um, if there is anyone who is an expansionist power, that is Russia, who is invading, who is yeah. coming without an invitation, uh, and it is enlargement when it comes to NATO because it is so hard to get yeah. there. It's not NATO who makes the first move. Yeah, okay. Well, I was quite aware of the fact that it was really uh, uh, demand-led rather than um, uh, the the uh, initiative coming from NATO because a lot of the countries wanted into NATO, and I at the time felt, well, that's that's not I I would feel if I were in Russia I wouldn't like it either, frankly. Uh, so I could understand uh, the objections, and and what my thought and many of us who were active in the peace movement uh, at that period. Uh, at the end of the Cold War were of the mind that what we wanted was to replace all of these security organizations with the OSCE. It's because countries, Russia was already in it and all these other countries could, as they became independent, also join. And I guess they did mostly. And, um, and that this, this would be um, a more acceptable security organization. Um, but it didn't happen, it didn't take off at all. And, and so I, I see the dilemma that if I were living in Georgia, I would want one thing, and if uh, I would have at the time anyway, wanted to be in NATO. And if I were living in uh, say Sochi, I would, I would not want it. So I understand why there was an issue there, but it, it shouldn't have been that big an issue. Anyway, we're talking about how to undo the the worst effects of the the breakup of the Soviet Union, and I, I don't think we're going to be able to succeed in doing that. So let's talk about something where we have some hope of actually making some progress, and that is, um, I think you're an expert on disinformation and especially the Russian efforts to cause trouble in other countries. So tell me what they do, and in pretty specific terms, what kinds of messages they try to convey using what kinds of platforms and so on to, um, to make trouble, because I think that's, that's really what they're doing is just trying to make trouble, right? Exactly. Thank you. Thank, thank you for considering an expert. Um, I mean, we are trying to call ourselves practitioners to not 
sound overly ambitious, uh, but we do work every day on this topic and uh, really um, happy to talk about it. Russia's, uh, there, there, there are a couple of things that Russians have not changed even from the Soviet Union. Um, take only 1980s, even at the time when Russia is becoming slightly more, Soviet Union is becoming slightly more liberal. At the time, Soviet Union plants a uh, fake story uh, uh, in a rogue, uh, uh, on purpose established newspaper in New Delhi and starts a narrative, a global narrative at the time that the United States came up with HIV, uh, AIDS, and wants to spread AIDS across the world to eliminate some parts of the globe on purpose. And then that starts that, you know, um, operation later comes to be called as oper Operation Infection, since it's related to the AIDS. And that Rogue newspaper, which is created by the KGB, super small newspaper that would grow from India, that would take off and go all the way to several major African countries and the rest of the African continent. And one or two years after, it starts being reported on the European continent and in, in, in mainstream United States media. Um, the reason I say this, is that those uh, uh, methods that Russians use now are not as in, in terms of broader concepts are not new at all, because now say uh, there, uh, is, uh, there is an ongoing, not complete yet, a major disinformation campaign where Russians are trying to, Russians are accusing uh, United States of running bioweapons labs in Ukraine and in Georgia, at least in those two countries, um, and trying to make, make the rest of the world believe that those two countries are uh, fields for the um, uh, US government uh, to create pathogens and, uh, and uh, cause disruption and human uh, 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 catastrophe. Uh, in Russia and across the world. So that said, I want to uh, connect those two dots. There are some differences in terms of tactics. There are differences in terms of um, in terms of uh, some of the uh, uh, technical maneuvers. But the the big picture has not changed. First, Russia, and then you know, as a parent uh, agent to the Soviet Union, has not changed conceptually. Those people who ran those campaigns run those campaigns now, their, their legacy is there. And first it is to diminish the American-led liberal world order. And second, for that uh, uh, reason, attack American reputation with any, by any means and anywhere in the world, especially in uh, strategically important countries like Ukraine and, and Georgia. Now we could, I uh, will stop here, we could discuss how this uh, technical war is here and there, uh, but Russia wants to use information as a weapon when information could be used as a tool. Okay, now that's interesting. You're saying this was happening while it was still the Soviet Union. You can't blame it on Putin, in other words. Unfortunately, the Russian society has been singing the same song um, as the Kremlin when it comes to some of the key facts Mm -hmm. on the ground in Ukraine, around Ukraine, causes of the war, uh, facts, uh, 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 and some of the, um, some of the uh, war crimes that Russians are committing. Most of the Russian population are not aware of those things. And that's what uh, uh, troubles us um, every day when we look at this uh, picture. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in fact, that, that is the most troubling thing when you see and here, I, I, I don't even want to say it's just, just Russia, because I get just as puzzled by the U.S. population. You know, if, if they, they, you know, all kinds of things like not believing in climate change and not believing viruses are dangerous and not believing, you know, believing guns are just fine and a whole bunch of things that 
are just strike me as absolutely so crazy that you wonder how a whole section of the population, if not the majority, can believe such things. And and so, but you know, before I was worried about the U.S., I was already worried about Russians uh, for for all the reasons I've just given that uh, that the unwillingness to um, to take a stand. I would say, you know, there was there's it's really hard to get a resistance movement going, and it may be, you know, that. They just got burned by having this horrible revolution. And they thought, well, we don't want to do that again. And, and, and so let's go along with whatever they tell us to do because it's better than, than trying to have a, a revolution like the, the one we, we had. Maybe that's the rationale, I don't know. But, but it, you know, I, was, I remember thinking, you know, at the time that these color revolutions were going on in Europe, um, People like, you know, you get um, hundreds of thousands of people going to Belgrade on a certain day to protest and to bring down Milosevic, which they did. And, and some of the other countries, we have similar things. And, and you, you might in a Moscow, which had, well, I don't know, 10,000 population, 10 million or something like that, 12 million, you'd get maybe a thousand people, you know. I mean, it just they weren't on the same level of of a um, protest. So the 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 um, it worried me, and then I thought, well, you know, there's I thought there's something wrong with Russians, and then I look at the U.S. and I think uh -uh. <laughs> it's a bigger problem than just Russia. So anyway, there you go. We may be critical. We may be critical of the you know perceptions and thoughts or uh, popular beliefs in certain parts of the United States in certain segments of this population, but at least they have access to diversity of sources yeah. and diversity of information, which is not the case in Russia. What the Russian government recently did is a continuation of what they started uh, in a head fashion a couple of years ago by designating all the um, all uh, uh, it, 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 different sources of information or awareness campaigns as foreign agents mm -hmm. or NGOs as foreign agents. Mm -hmm. What the Russians now did, by Russians I do mean the Russian government and the Kremlin, is that they banned uh, Twitter, they banned Facebook, um, and other uh, social media that, companies. That, that's not Russia. quite true. I don't. I don't think they're banned because I. I just today looked and sure enough. I mean, I've got Russians uh, posting things on Facebook. Now they don't say anything. I mean, they talk about their dog or what or what they had for breakfast or something. But they don't. There's no way they're going to talk about anything uh, substantive in terms of geopolitical uh, controversies. But they are there. Uh, and maybe it's because they have these, what do they have these, call them the private? Uh, the virtual private network, VPN. Yeah. Is that uh, how they manage to keep on using, say, Facebook? That's right. If you're, uh, there are now two factors, at least. One, if you're a Russian uh, a citizen and national, um, and you're still using, say, Facebook or Instagram, you're either not in Russia now, and you just moved to a neighboring country to have access. One of the countries is Georgia, the other is um, Armenia or Azerbaijan or any others or the Baltics. Or you have a VPN, which still um, not everybody knows how to use a virtual private network or not everybody has the access to VPN. Um, and third, even if you access Facebook using those two uh, uh, ways of uh, connection, um, you're still unable to say something that is critical uh, uh, to the government, of the government, um, because you may directly go to the jail, to jail. Um, so what have Russia they, I, I, I talked to somebody just yesterday, this is a current issue for me because I'm planning a new, <laughs> a new project I'll tell you about in a minute. But uh, I just talked yesterday to somebody who's uh, trying to set up more contacts between uh, dissidents, if you will, in Russia or anybody in Russia, 
and uh, outsiders. And uh, they, um, he says that he hasn't heard of anybody who's actually been arrested for this. Um, th they talked about sending people to jail for 15 years if they, if they say anything public about it. But he thinks that they haven't been actually arresting people. And I, if you know that they have been, then it's important for me to know that because what I'm planning to do, and you might even want to participate, I would be happy if you do. Um, I'm trying to get all of my Facebook friends, and I have about, oh, I think 50 or 70 uh, people in Russia who are Facebook friends of mine. That doesn't mean I actually know all of them, because I don't know how we got to be friends, but you know, we are sort of, but I don't know them all. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to invite them to participate in my uh, global town hall, which I do on the last Sunday of every month, that I get anybody in the world who wants to come on Zoom and we just have an open conversation. And I've been having people from Russia and from Ukraine uh, in small numbers, but I, I expect I'm reaching out to them now and inviting more of my Russian uh, and, and Ukrainian acquaintances to join in just to have a conversation about whatever's on their mind. It doesn't have to be about geopolitics. Sometimes we talk about other things, you know. Anyway, if I'm going to get people in trouble that way, then I should know about it. Yeah, there um, we've seen people, um, even beyond Facebook, we've seen people being arrested in front of the Kremlin for just holding an anti-war banner. It's not even anti-Kremlin, it's an anti-war, just stop the war. Um, even it is criminalized now in Russia to say that Russia is waging war in yeah. Ukraine. Even yeah, that, that was, yeah, that was true from the very beginning. In fact, in fact, I know of a case where a girl just holds up an empty sign, you know, blank cardboard, and she gets arrested anyway because it's clear what she means. But, um, but uh, that, that, I mean, he, he was saying that you still can use Facebook and not get arrested. The cases are arbitrary as much as the Russian um, application of law. Uh, it is arbitrary to the degree where if Russian government thinks that this particular user is influential enough or important enough to uh, local or national community uh, that could cause some sorts of... Uh, explosion of the topic nationally, then that person will face trouble, unfortunately. What the Russian government has done uh, is a major move in terms of controlling, not only limiting, but controlling the speech. First, they banned all major Western platforms and they, uh, I believe they have designated Facebook as an extremist organization against, uh, you know, versus the uh, uh, Russian uh, siding, Russia's national security interests, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, but what they have also done is that they have maintained the government and diplomatic accounts on those platforms to spread the version of information about anything else that they want. Um, that's uh, why I'm wearing uh, this T-shirt which says suspend Kremlin. And we are, my organization, uh, the uh, Digital Diplomacy Task Force that I established with my colleagues and friends, international friends, as a response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine is arguing that it is uh, arguing uh, and trying to convince three major platforms, Twitter, Google, and uh, uh, Meta, uh, that uh, it is the Russian government to be suspended as a state actor, as someone who is promoting propaganda war, a war propaganda, but those platforms and everybody else should do their best to enable regular citizens um, with uh, every tool possible to inform them um, about the uh, war in Ukraine or anything else that is, uh, that is going to help them be more informed as citizens. Um, that's why we are advocating for suspending the Kremlin but empowering the citizens. Can that be done technologically? I mean, the Kremlin can just open a, a, an account in the name of, uh, you know, Joe Blow or, you know, anybody 
uh, and, uh, and, and continue doing what they're doing. At this point, uh, it is pretty visible and evident um, that uh, official Kremlin accounts, many of them do have labels, you know, uh, recognizing them as important players on, the, on, on, those, uh, on those platforms. Um, they do have so far pretty influential uh, official accounts of the Kremlin, of this embassy, of the other embassy that is essentially uh, justifying everything that the center says. So the first move that we argue is right, is to deplatform them, suspend them until they change the behavior that they're uh, uh, displaying now. Uh, and that leads to real life harm and the loss of uh, uh, children's lives and so on and so forth. And then there is the other angle that we call, and Facebook, for instance, calls coordinated inauthentic behavior when a state player like Russia creates some uh, uh, difficult to identify accounts or networks of accounts at the time. Uh, there are some systems and processes that those companies have to recognize them and then to remove them if they are trying to promote a certain narrative or disinformation against a person or against another state entity that is illegal. Okay, is there reciprocity? Does the US or do, do any of the NATO countries do anything that would be comparable to this kind of disinformation campaign? No, uh, the, the, my, my answer is no, because um, those uh, countries, um, every, every NATO member country has in, in the worst case scenario, uh, better accountability than any other player that is with Russia or that is in Russia. Um, and um, any spread of disinformation, we may argue that Western countries are promoting narratives. Otherwise, what, what are they define as strategic communication? But those narratives and those match messages are scrutinized by tens of fact checkers. Um, and um, national and intergovernmental and international players. Um, and that's what is legit. Our organization, our colleagues, the analysts that we deal with every day have no problem engaging in the process. A Western politician may well lie, and we have seen that, but there is also a free media that would expose the lie, that would fact check. Uh, the lie. Uh, when it comes to Russia, Russians have designated everyone who could uh, who could fact check them. Russians have designated everyone like that as an extremist or an, as an agent mm -hmm. and have uh, uh, driven them out of Russia. So at this point, the, the short answer is no. The Western um, uh, state actors and the West as a collective uh, community uh, does not choose this information as a tool or as a okay, weapon. Fair, fair enough. I tend to believe you, uh, but there is this thing about if you look at the if you compare this the narratives of coming out of out of uh, the the you know the networks or the uh, official U.S. Uh, major publications. Uh, it's going to look quite different from anything that would come out of um, <clears throat> out of Russia, um, either RT or um, any other. And in fact, not just Russia, but Russian allies. I think is true. You there's certainly a slant, and this I don't think you have to pay Western journalists to ha to exhibit that slant. I don't think you have to control them or even. Uh, it, it directly tell them what to do, they will automatically present a, a certain point of view, just as I'm going to automatically present my point of view. And you can, you know, you're going to, somebody else will say that I have a bias. Um, well, I have a point of view anyway. And whether it's more accurate or more truthful than somebody else's point of view, I think is an interesting question. And if somebody really catches me as in a flagrant distortion of truth, I hope they tell me about it and make sure that I get disciplined for it. Exactly. Um, sometimes um, uh, 
uh, uh, there is this uh, simple comparison between what constitutes a disinformation and what constitutes a lie. So I myself, I'm not, I'm not chasing lies because we are human beings and we are imperfect and we lie or we say some things that is coming out of our biased selves or we have interest in saying some, some things in a certain way. When it comes to disinformation, we'd like to distinguish here uh, and define disinformation. In fact, it's been defined for a couple of years now as such disinformation that is a, as mostly, but not necessarily a state-sponsored, coordinated, consistent, and well-resourced effort using information tools, using technology tools, and sometimes even intelligence tools that big countries can afford, afford only to, uh, to do internationally. So these are a, a menu of tools used in chunks, in clusters, or together to achieve political and geopolitical objectives. Um, so if someone lies, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it up to the audience, but if someone uses those so deeply sophisticated methods, strategy and tactics and means and, and money uh, to achieve political objectives at the expense of human exploitation, at the expense of exploiting everything that is possible, that is the problem. And uh, that's what we are uh, trying to deal with. Uh, that's what a lot of players in the European Union, in the rest of Europe, and many of uh, my colleagues and organizations in the United States are trying to deal with. If, there, if someone is lying, uh, it, it, it's, it's easier to scrutinize, it's easier to expose the person. Sometimes those people do get away with it, uh, but ultimately uh, it has less real life uh, 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 effect. And it hopefully does not lead to um, someone's a loss of life. Uh, and okay, the, the, the impression I got from reports of how the Russians were trying to uh, influence American politics suggested, uh, this was a year or two ago, that uh, what they seem to be doing is finding groups of people who have some real uh, issue with each other that they don't get along and, and they may have good or bad reasons for being angry or hostile to each other and they just go in and stir it a little bit just make exacerbate it by using stronger language and pitting them more and more against each other and there was I believe I heard of a, a case where they actually got a, a organized a group of people I a, maybe it was some ethnic group in the U.S. can't remember what population it was they 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 had a a meeting uh, in public, and and they confronted another group, uh, and both groups had been in fact created by the uh, disinformation campaigns that had been used to whip up their antagonism toward each other, and they met in the street. You know, now I don't know whether that's true. I can't even remember the details, but it was an amazingly, well, I think convincing notion that you if you if it hasn't been done it's possible to do it what do you think it is unfortunately possible and and unfortunately it, it was possible too when it happened it happened a couple of years ago and uh, it is pretty much confirmed now that the russia's internet so-called internet research agency aka a troll a major troll factory um and this information um warehouse i would say uh, that is managed uh, by someone called Yevgeny Prigozhin, that's uh, a major Russian oligarch uh, directly related and managed uh, by the Kremlin. Um, and they did organize um, one notorious, but many besides that um, in, the, in the United States and, and beyond the United States. And they did uh, uh, manage those two uh, separate meetings. Now, one thing that was uh, noticeable is that people went there, um, American citizens went there with genuine concerns about domestic affairs, 
a major frustration that I watched some reporting, media, media reporting about this. And one citizen got asked, did you know that the rally you just joined recently was managed and organized by the Russians and that woman was angered and angry. And she said, no, I did not go. I did not want to believe that I went somewhere to protest something. And I did not know it was organized by the Russians. It was not organized by the Russians. And the Russians, that's the strategy, the divide and rule. Russians want we to have, us to have uh, apathy towards anything that is institutionally democratic, a gathering, a, a, an expression, so on and so forth. And then they try to um, understand the audiences in as deep as possible so that they could exploit every fissure that is coming from ethnic grounds to the religious grounds to some any other political uh, divides and then they go and exploit um, as much as possible. Good news is that it's more known now. We know better uh, the sources and means and ways and, 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 and methods of execution and planning of, of the Russian government and any other government that may engage in it. It's easier to detect now. Unfortunately, there is some co uh, cost paid already uh, by the Americans, by the rest of the international population. Um, uh, that became victim of such instigated, handmade, human-made, so-called crises. Um, well, yes, I, I hear that. I'm, I'm glad to know that you think they're you're getting some handle on it. But I, I I've read that if the, what some people thought all you had to do with, let's say, up with Facebook, if you could put up a thing saying this is disputed information. This is not, we, we, we have reason to think this may not be true. And you post that along with the post. This is a warning that this may be what they call fake news. But that it turns out that people are just as willing to believe it anyway, that as if the UN told them at all. So don't bother because it doesn't help. Um, is that the case? And if so, what's the next best thing to do about it? Exactly. There, um, another good news is that there are now increasingly more awareness because of that. There is uh, a lot of trust and safety measures and guidelines created. And there are a lot of good people working, good uh, caring and uh, experienced professionals um, across platforms in the civil society, in the media that are trying to generate some mutual uh, 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 benefit in terms of collaborating and creating multi-stakeholder uh, uh, forums and so on and so forth. So because of that, there, it, it is a lot easier now to detect a coordinated effort that is trying to exploit human nature, that is trying to exploit a certain community anywhere uh, in the world. The companies have national analysts, they have subject matter experts more and more to try to prevent, or if not preventable, try to reduce the effects of such a, uh, of, of such an effort. There is one thing that is called um, coordinated inauthentic behavior, as we also mentioned recently, where someone says that, you know, it is a, a person uh, and that someone is not that person. And uh, that's oh, why- is that, is that what they call bots? Bots and trolls, and it may be, it may be, you know, automated accounts that where one person can manage tens of accounts or more, but also human beings. But they also uh, 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 use fake identities to promote a certain narrative, certain theme, certain belief in a community. So there are now two ways: one, human beings sitting. Um, uh, in those companies and platforms. And the other is automated effort that is trying to understand that sort of behavior, try to mitigate it or try to eliminate it as much as possible. So it is there, but the human, uh, as, much as, as much as we are imperfect, as much as we'd like to consume information, I compare it usually with a uh, junk food. We know, that junk food is harmful to a degree, 
to health or to this and to uh, something else. To sorry, obesity. we know that what is? Junk food. Um, junk food. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so we know it, but we still consume it. So that I say because uh, we will also know, uh, I believe, and we, we desserts, uh, to a degree know now that some sort of information may not be accurate, but it's appealing to me. It is appealing to my pre-existing beliefs and biases and feelings. And uh, I do not necessarily need to check the accuracy of that information. That's the feeling. And uh, it's gonna be a continued battle because of it, because states and institutions and schools and um, everybody else who is responsible to public safety and public education will have to do that work for life. So your job uh, as Suspend Kremlin is to try to uh, promote some changes in the platforms and try to get them to cut off the worst offenders. Is that about it? Yes, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for mentioning that again. Um, uh, it, we are committed to helping uh, as someone we're trying to, uh, we are positioning ourselves as uh, diplomats in digital affairs, digital diplomats, digital diplomacy task force wants to accomplish two things. One, uh, to try to clean the uh, environment as much as possible, help mm -hmm. do that. And doing that is, is only possible if we uh, uh, allow legitimate debaters, honest citizens who really want to voice their ideas and their concerns and their points online as much as they would do it offline. And if someone wants to portray themselves as a demo uh, democratic debater, then these people should abide by some rules. Mm -hmm. um, what the, what the Kremlin is now doing is that they're suspending their citizens they're banning everybody who's critical of them, but they're trying to promote their narrative that is leading to real life harm. And um, I want to add one thing here is that um, we are not doing this because based, of our, uh, based on our feelings. We are taking action that is, uh, um, uh, that is uh, rooted into international law, such as the United Nations Mm -hmm. uh, international Covenant on Political and Civil Rights that says that propaganda for war is illegal. And there is other measures that is coming from those uh, technology and social media platforms, trust and safety guidelines and everything else, so that we do not want to walk the fine line where we take an action and or based on our argument, someone takes action and that leads to some ramifications that would limit someone's freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, true freedom of speech would be problematic and hard to ensure if there are so many disruptors in a coordinated uh, uh, fashion that would hate every angle and every segment of the freedom of speech. And uh, that came to, uh, that, you know, that uh, our effort is intensified uh, by the fact that Ukraine uh, is the target now and Ukraine is a battlefield, not only uh, for uh, legitimacy of, you know, and sovereignty reasons, but also, you know, for testing how we could endure and you know, how we could fight back. Thank you so much. I certainly wish you well. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for this enlightening conversation. So carry on and let's, let's stay in touch because I think what you're doing is extremely important. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to be here with you. Good. See you again. Bye-bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week and sometimes more. This is episode number 475. You can watch them or listen as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. Eventually, we post the transcripts there too. When you get there, look around. We have conversations going on there about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar 
or the name of one of the guest speakers. And after you've watched, scroll down and share your thoughts about the show. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can buy a single copy or subscribe for $20 Canadian per year through PressReader. Just go to PressReader.com on your browser and in the search bar enter the word Peace. You'll see the cover of the current issue and buttons to click to subscribe.